Well, welcome to the Freedom of Information Act panel, where we will be talking about how to get public records uh, from the government, uh, whether that is uh, from the federal government, or maybe we can also talk a little bit about the state level. Um, I'm Dave Moss. I work at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, which is a nonprofit that works on digital civil liberties issues. I particularly work on police surveillance, and so it involves filing a lot of public records requests to get information about uh, stingrays, license plate readers, use of databases, you name it. Um, we're going to do just sort of a quick round of introductions, starting with my uh, sister here. And this is the first time we've done anything professional together. So uh, awesome. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Pamela Moss. I'm an attorney based in Denver, Colorado. And I mainly represent uh, folks that are injured. 50% um, uh, of my caseload is kind of traditional personal injury work. And then I represent a lot of sex assault victims and victims of, of violent crime in cases where third parties or the government or um, other institutions are involved. Hi, I'm Amy Stepanovich. I am the US policy manager at an organization called Access Now. We work on human rights and the intersection of human rights with technology, more specifically. Um, so issues from privacy to freedom of expression um, and end up having two FOIA requests fairly frequently um, for records in DC. Uh, previously, I was at the Electronic Privacy Information Center, which is arguably one of the more prolific um, FOIA requesters in DC, where I had a much more extensive FOIA practice, including a lot of litigation work. Hi, I'm Cara Chapel. Uh, I was previously out in Colorado as a senior lit paralegal in personal injury field. I relocated back to the East Coast uh, couple of years ago and now I'm a FOIA specialist working for one of the municipalities on the East Coast so I am the bad guy on this panel. Awesome. So I'm going to do a, 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 just a quick presentation doing an overview of what the Freedom of Information Act is, maybe a little bit about how I use it and then I'm going to actually just file one on the screen while uh, other folks are answering questions and telling a little bit about their work and how they use it. Sound good? Awesome. All right, uh, just so you know, I'm not a lawyer, and so this is not uh, legal advice. I have to do a few disclaimers here. I also sit on a government body in San Francisco that oversees uh, transparency issues, and I'm not speaking on their behalf today. And also, these laws are very complicated at times, and so this is just going to be a quick overview. Uh, you know, there's a lot of resources online to give you a bigger, uh, a more in-depth look. Uh, there are two main levels that I, I, I like to talk about. One is the Federal Freedom of Information Act, so that's how you get things from, uh, we'll kind of go over that in another slide, but you know, federal agencies. And then each state has its own uh, version of the Freedom of Information Act. Some states like uh, Florida and, and Washington have better laws. Uh, some states don't have as great laws. I don't think California's is particularly great. Um, so why transparency? Why freedom of information laws? And you know, it's because you start with the belief that the public has a right to know what's going on. The government belongs to us, and therefore their records belong to us. And when you get those records, it helps inform debate so we can actually have discussions about things that are based in evidence, based in you know budgets, based on a history of what an agency does. And also, this is how we uh, you know we're able to find waste and corruption, and maybe it deters waste and corruption because people know that what they put on paper is going to get see the light of day at some point. Also, I find it really fun, um, as we will find in, in, in a little bit. Um, I also often use a, uh, there's this analogy that people who uh, handle public records requests use where they say you're on a fishing expedition. You're just asking for records and you don't know what you want. You're just going to get everything. Um, I like to flip that a little bit um, because there is really no perfect way to file a FOIA request. It really is every pond is different and every pond has fish that are different and every you know fisherman has his own lure and way of doing it in their own legal language. And you know there are no consistency in the type of results that come back. It really is you try one thing, you try another thing, maybe eventually you get the records you want. I also you like to use the, uh, the old game Battleship where maybe you file a FOIA request and you get one document that references other documents and then you just keep filing and filing and filing until you get the full picture. So the Freedom of Information Act is a federal law that requires go the government to make certain records public. Um, anyone can file a, a government records request, including people who are not U.S. citizens, with the exception that a, a, a recent update to the law from a few years back uh, said that if you are a foreign government, you can't request records from intelligence agencies. And it allows anyone to sue the government for access to records. Um, there's this concept that of presumption of disclosure, which means that 
government records, you know, all things being equal, a government record should be should be disclosed and open to the public. And there are only certain exemptions that a government agency can use to withhold records. And there are a lot of them, and I'm not going to read them all off. You can see the slides afterwards, or you can look online. But they often include things like national security documents, trade secrets, uh, personnel things, things related to law enforcement investigations, that sort of thing. I guess oil wells is on here. Um, I don't know if you care about oil wells. Um, it applies to uh, gov all, you know, government agencies, executive branch. It does not apply to uh, Congress. It does not apply to the White House. It does not apply to the judiciary. I believe the judiciary has a separate rule that you can request some administrative records through. Um, but it also does government-owned corporations like Amtrak. Um, already said that. Um, so there's a lot of different records you might want to get. You know, you might want to get emails between people on an issue. You may want to find a calendar of a particular agency. Obviously, reports. You know, inspector general investigations. I like to look at like government contracts for things. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of stuff you can get. Um, and then the first step is to kind of decide uh, what you want and what agency might have it. Um, and they have to be directed at that you can't just send it to a random government address and ex at least not right now and expect it to automatically make it to the agency that you want you do have to be a little bit specific and you can't ask for all records that the agency has ever produced you can't say I want every email that has ever been sent by the FEC because that's just not gonna happen um, and you can't force an agency to create a record that doesn't exist. Um, you can sometimes ask for help to identify what records might answer your question. On the state level, like in California, they are required to be helpful to you. Um, so you can ask for requests and say, I want to know this thing, what document is going to have that, and then they're supposed to help specify. So, you know, this is not an example of what you should do. You should not say something, for those of you who can't read it, it says, I request all your documents. <laughs> And you must give them to me because FOIA. No, more like this. Uh, you know, pursuant to FOIA, I want a record of your secret interpretation of the NSA spying program that allows you to, you know, collect people's phone call records. Glomar. What's that? Glomar. You might get a Glomar for that. <laughs> you can explain Glomar in a little bit. Um, so, you know, certain things you're going to want to do is, uh, you know, look for references to documents, whether that is. Um, you know, something you see in a news article or something that's said in a speech. I also suggest that you maybe spend some time looking through the uh, government agency's website before you bother to file a FOIA because there's often, often that records are already exist online, either because somebody else put in a FOIA request or because they just have like a database of documents that they make available. Um, you should also know that they can charge you a fee to produce copies and so it, um, often helps to say in your request that you want to, you know, if it's going to be more than $10, please let me know and we can, you know, I can narrow my request or I'm willing to pay up to $50. Um, with state level ones, there's often the ability for you to go inspect in person to, you know, skip all fees possible. Um, there's a few ways you can get out of a fee if you say that you are a member of the news media, which can be like a broad description of what a news media is. It's not just like newspapers. Um, or you can make the argument that you're not charging anyone for the records, you're not monetizing these records, and that if you release these records, it is going to contribute significantly to the public's understanding of government activities. Um, you can also ask them to speed it up, um, which doesn't happen that often. I've had it happen a couple of times. Um, and, you know, some agencies do accept it via email. Some will only take fax or snail mail, which is pretty irritating to me. Um, some have, like, an online portal that you can fill out. Uh, we had a little battle with the FBI because they were testing out a system and they wanted you to upload your driver's license, which there is no reason whatsoever you should have to upload your driver's license for a, uh, for a FOIA request. And there's a 20-day deadline for an agency to get back to you, um, and uh, it's not not something they uh, adhere to very often in my experience. Um, then after, you, and, and Amy's going to talk a little bit about what happens if you, you get rejected or you don't get the records you want. Um, you can, uh, you know, you can appeal and that's usually the first step. There's another independent agency called the Office of Government Information Services. You can ask them to get involved. You can try again and you can sue. Um, there's three kind of good tools out there for filing. You know, if you don't want to just write up your letter and send it, there are some automated systems. One I'm going to demonstrate in a little bit is called Muckrock. Uh, but the FOIA machine is also a similar thing. And then the Reporters Committee for Free Press has something called iFOIA. 
um, and all of them will, to one extent or another, help you with form language. Um, Muckrock will actually send reminder emails when you hit the deadline to the agency, and then they will accept the documents on your behalf and upload them online. Um, like I said, you should search online first. A little like pro tip is uh, I often will put in the search term, and then I'll put site colon dot gov, and it will search, you know. Uh, .gov domains looking for the records that meet that regard. You can even actually add site colon gov and then file type .pdf to get all PDFs that reference that, that title. Um, I want to give you an example of some that I thought were pretty fun and maybe Dragon Con specific. So I was at San Diego Comic Con uh, in July and the History Channel set a boat on fire in the, uh, in the harbor and I thought to myself, how the heck did they get permission to do this? Like, surely there's like environmental issues, you know, how did they do it? So I put in a FOIA request, um, and I got lots of like boring paperwork, but I also got the, uh, the map of the plan that they did, and if I had filed it before Comic-Con, I could have done a spoiler on it, because this was filed like more than a month in advance. Uh, and then my favorite is, here's the artist's illustration of what it was supposed to look like. <laughs> it did not look like this. You can see that there's no flaming sky behind it. There's just a gross bridge, and I think that's like the some banana like import business. <laughs> it's, I think it's the Dole factory, but that looks way better, right? Um, uh, uh, another one that I, fought, I found is that uh, the city of San Diego wanted to name a street after Mark Hamill, and I was like, well, I'm gonna FOIA that because if I see it involves the government, I'm like, I can get those records. Anyway, I got like 450 pages worth of documents, and there were some interesting things in there. Like for one, um, originally there was a road that was called Chargers Boulevard, and the Chargers had just moved from San Diego, and everybody didn't want to live on the Chargers Boulevard anymore. Um, so they were pursuing that to name that Mark Hamill, and then they realized everybody would have to change their mailing addresses. And then people were like, well, no, let's find a street that nobody lives on and change that. Um, we found the correspondence from, uh, you know, the... Um, local stormtroopers group that wanted to come and, and join and they said no please don't come and I was like oh man that's a pretty bummer and then we got numbers on how much the sign cost how much it cost for the police to come out how much it cost for the barricades for the event how much it cost to rent the stages but the best thing I got direct messages on Twitter between Mark Hamill and a city council member uh, you know where he is very uh, excited about getting the uh, the award, and they discuss the logistics and who his guests can be, and how he's going to park down the street and get escorted by security guards because he doesn't want to get swarmed. And I thought that was shows the power of uh, of the California Public Records Act that you can get Mark Hamill's direct messages. That's what I got for this, and so we're gonna I'm gonna you can kind of keep out of the corner of your eye seeing this uh, public records request that I'm going to be putting together. Um, we have a panel tonight. I'm on a panel tonight about the show Hunted, which is a CBS reality show about surveillance. And I think I'm going to file some requests today about the TV show Hunted uh, that I can, you know, maybe next year, I, by the time I get the records back, uh, I can talk about. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and start with Pam. Um, Pam, can you uh, uh, tell us a little bit about how you uh, use these laws in your work as, a, as a, an attorney? So um, I'm typically using the state equivalent of FOIA in my practice as a lawyer representing folks. Um, most states have um, their own state one. Uh, Dave was just talking about California's. Colorado has one very similar. Um, I had um, I sue the government sometimes. I also sue a lot of uh, corporations and insurance companies. Um, so a lot of times I'm getting the records so that I can get the business or insurance company that's hiding bad conduct, uh, conduct on the hook. Um, so if you know anything about litigation um, in the civil arena, uh, which is where I practice, it's mainly the game is uh, people who have done bad things are trying to hide the records. So when we send discovery or we ask for records, uh, they typically don't uh, give them to us or they hide them. And so public records requests are kind of um, the number one way that I find kind of the smoking gun or the thing that really helps my client prove that the business either is doing unsafe practices or knew about a problem and is hiding it um, and is really um, causing uh, safety concerns um, in the community at large. So to give an example, um, I had a case against a um, jail in Colorado. Um, my client um, was the family of a woman who died in the jail. 
Um, it's a very unfortunate case. She was withdrawing from alcohol, and so simply either getting her to the ER or giving her Gatorade um, could have pre prevented that. Um, alcohol withdrawal, it's very um, rare for someone to die from that. So the, the uh, jail system did not um, do anything. She passed away, and so we represented her heirs and her small children um, to recover. Um, so from doing um, Colorado open records requests, we were able to get um, not only com prior complaints with the jail, but you know the full files for everything, um, much sooner than we would through the discovery process. And we were able to get a lot of warnings and things that we wouldn't necessarily get. Um, when to give you another state example, um, suing a corporation, um, I've used open records requests. I have a case right now um, where my client was um, a domestic violence victim. She was at a nightclub. Um, she went up to security and um, her abuser had shown up at the nightclub and was um, threatening her and pushing her and so she went up to security and asked for help. Um, security said they would take care of it um, and make sure she was okay. They did not. Um, and then she got beaten up pretty badly in the parking lot by her abuser. Um, so I was able to use open records requests. I mean, the bar um, and nightclub um, has a pattern of this. So my open records requests were able to get um, calls for service with similar type incidents, um, board meetings, um, city council meetings, um, lots of information that shows that not only did the bar have the pattern of doing this, but that um, this is something they should have corrected. So it's really been critical in my practice for finding um, documentation um, that corporations typically want to hide. So thank you. Awesome. All right, so moving on to Amy. Amy, tell us what happens when your request is improperly uh, rejected. Sure. Um, before I do that, though, I do want to start with my funnest fact about FOIA um, that you guys can all take back with you. Do you all know who Florida Man is? Maybe. Yeah, you've heard of Florida Man. Um, I'm from Florida. What? So Florida Man is supposedly is the culmination of a bunch of stupid people that live in Florida that do really weird things like drive naked through the drive through um, I learned a while ago that one of the reasons Florida Man exists is not because people are dumber or do dumber things in Florida. It's because Florida has really good open records laws on arrests. And so it is very easy for people to get records of when police are detaining or interacting with people in Florida. And so one of the reasons you hear about it more often from the state of Florida is because of their state open records laws, which I found fascinating. Um, and I have now shared it with all of you. So next time you see Florida Man, you, you know my fun fact. Um, very, very frequently, I've only really worked with FOIA on the federal level. Um, they have deadlines, like Dave said, and in my experience, about 90% of the time, they are not going to meet their own deadline. Um, or they're going to issue you a response within that deadline um, that isn't an actual response within the FOIA. Um, and once that happens, you have a lot of recourse available to you. Um, the first thing you can do is file an administrative appeal. And that basically is reiterating your FOIA request. Um, you state that you know, the agency had an obligation to respond to you within um, the allotted number of working days. Um, I believe under the FOIA it's, it's business days and not days. So it's 20 business days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, take out holidays, etc. And, and you want them to continue to process the request. This takes your request out of the queue of requests and puts it into another queue for appealed requests. Um, that can slow the process down, ironically, or speed it up, um, depending. Um, but what it does is it does move it through the process and sometimes gets an extra pair of eyes on it from the appeal office that can trigger it to move faster. Um, if you receive a response that you don't think is a good response under the FOIA. And by way of example, um, I filed a FOIA request this year with the National um, Park Service because if many of you in the room might remember, the National Park Service had tweeted some um, very interesting climate change facts and then those tweets were deleted. And they were told that those tweets were not deleted because of any pressure from anybody in government um, or from the White House, but that it was social media policy. 
and that it was something that they just shouldn't have posted to begin with. So I asked for their social media policies and wanted to know what in their social media policies it was that were getting these tweets taken down. Um, they responded that they were not going to, that they would process my request, that they were setting themselves a deadline of X to process my request, and if I did not hear from them by that deadline, I could consider my request closed. They can't do that. You cannot close a request um, at the deadline. They actually have to continue processing it after the deadline. Um, these are the type of responses that you could actually go to um, the Office of Government Information Services, or OGIS, because DC loves acronyms. Um, and OGIS uh, basically is a counselor, like a relationship counselor for FOIA requesters and FOIA agencies to say, actually, this is a bad process. You can't do this. Let's try to fix this fundamental misunderstanding of FOIA or bad implementation of FOIA to help the requester, but also it's very good for these broad type of responses that are going to implicate other requesters as well. Um, it, OGIS is not so good for the one-off, this person didn't respond to my request within so many days. Um, they can try to help you with that, but those very specific circumstances, they're not going to be so good for. Um, so OGIS appeal, you still haven't gotten your records, you're at your wit's end, the next stage is litigation, um, which is really the fun part. Um, it's the reason that I have a case where I am attorney of record against the NSA, and I was able to have that within my first year as a lawyer. Um, life goals right there. And that's where you say, you actually, you, you had to respond to my request within this time, I filed the request, I filed the repeal, appeal, I've gone through all of the process, you still have not responded, give me my records. Um, the great thing about FOIA litigation, unlike other litigation, is it's mostly done on motions, um, which means it, it's exciting but it's also kind of boring because how you fight with an agency in court on FOIA is you write a bunch of things and submit it to the court. You don't actually have, get to go in and, and fight with them um, in person frequently. Um, it's very, very frequent that you get records almost immediately um, or very quickly after filing a lawsuit. Um, and then most of the lawsuit is about what redactions, what exemptions, what records they are not withholding. And so it can get fairly te technical into the exemptions that Dave talks about. But one of the things it does do is it pushes that process. You can get records really fast um, as opposed to the slower administrative process where I've had requests it for three years. In fact, recently the FBI was like, do you still want these records you requested three years ago? We found your request and realized we never answered you. And I was like, actually, yes, I do still want those records I requested three years ago. Please get those to me. Um, that's how long this can really take in the long run. I do want to say a word about Glomar because I think it's one of the more interesting ways that you can that an agency can respond to you under FOIA. Um, does anybody know what the Glomar was? This was actually EFF Runs Trivia. Yeah, the Glomar was a ship. Um, and somebody requested records about that ship and the government basically said, actually, we're neither going to confirm nor deny that these records exist. And that record, that response from a government agency is now known as a Glomar response um, in honor of this ship and the first time that it was invoked. They use it for a lot of things. And if you ever request anything from NSA, CIA, basically any intelligence agency, you will eventually and very quickly see a, we will neither confirm nor deny. My favorite time when that was invoked was we asked, in 2009, Google got hacked. Um, probably by the Chinese government. And so we went to the, and afterward they implemented much more stringent security features for Gmail. And we went to the NSA and we were like, we would like to see records of your conversations with Google after Google was hacked to see if you provided advice on how to implement these stronger security standards. And the NSA came back and said, we can neither confirm nor deny that we have any communications from Google. And we were like, actually, you should respond because Google sends out a lot of marketing emails, which would have absolutely zero impact on national security if you said that you had records that you had received from Google and disclosed that to us. And there might be other records that you don't want to disclose, but you shouldn't be able to glomar the entire response. Um, unfortunately, we took that through litigation and the court was like, no, they can issue that response even on a request 
that broad. Um, so the Glomar can be used frequently. It means at that point a request is pretty much shut down. Um, you can still fight it like we did. Um, unfortunately, the courts have held up its use in very broad circumstances. Awesome. So I, this is, I think, my fourth year doing this panel. It's the first year that we have somebody who's actually a FOIA officer or a public records officer uh, on the panel. So, uh, Cara, from, from your position as somebody who gets these requests and has to fulfill these requests, wh what, what's it like? Okay, well, uh, so in Virginia, they do have a FOIA law that is similar in nature to the federal one. Uh, we work in tandem, my office works in tandem uh, pretty pretty closely with our city attorney's office, and we are held to a very high standard in terms of our turnaround time. You know, we do get the 20 business days if we need it. it it's typically broken down to uh, the first five days, five business days, you have to look at it, and if you're not able to respond within those first five business days, you can then invoke an additional seven business days, which gets you to your 20. Um, for a FOIA response coming in, let's use an example, say, our city council has approved construction uh, in an area and is assigning $150 million of taxpayer money to it. And people get a little upset about that. They're like, well, what's going on with that? So they want a FOIA that information. How did you come to that determination and you know who approved it, who said what? So my FOIA request is I want everything that had to do with this construction of this superpower arena, uh, send me everything that you have. And the first response to that is going to be that's overly broad because there's a lot of players involved and there's no real way that we can respond to that and all the information uh, is Again, it's just an overly broad thing. So from a FOIA officer's aspect, you have to turn around and say, I need to narrow this request down. You need to be more specific. Uh, if you would like the emails from, and this is not information we're going to tell you, I'm going to tell you now, um, you can say something along the lines of, I would like all the emails between this city council person, this city council person, and this person for a specific period of time, and that is a narrowed FOIA request, and much more manageable, because when you're talking about every piece of communication that may have gone out about the arena project that's being built, you could be talking about hundreds of people's involvement and the amount of time that it takes to extrapolate all of that information and then put it together in a form, read it, redact it if necessary, and put it together in a form that's understandable for the person on the outside. So uh, that may explain some of the delay that you're looking at when you are seeing things going to government agencies and people send overly broad requests. You need to narrow these down to something that's manageable and understandable to the officer who's actually going to get your request. Um, so uh, hopefully that helps explain at least a little bit of why the, the government part piece of it takes so long uh, and people are not being narrow enough in their requests. Awesome. So I want to follow on that. So we have someone in the audience who is a Department of Defense uh, FOIA officer, and I just wanted to ask, um, could we, the orange box, could we right here? I just wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit about the declassification process. So and what mandatory declassification review is, or if somebody puts a request that you know, maybe implicates national security or something like that, how you handle it. Yep. Oh. Am I going to get you back here? Okay. All right. So uh, I was the FOIA officer for CJTF OIR. Um, say again? Okay. Uh, I was the FOIA officer for CJTF OIR, which is a counter ISIS fight. Um, and pretty much any record request that came concerning that fight came through me. Uh, as far as the declassification process, um, everything. Every record within the DOD is, is classified a kind of a, a different way. Um, but typically things, especially in wartime, are overclassified, as we found. And so it, it actually went hand in hand with our effort to work with our coalition partners, because we had 64 nations working together, um, trying to keep things at least classified at a level that we could share with partner agencies, both 5i and um, well, non 5i, including some slightly questionable alliances that we had. Um, so in that regard, we had a lot of support within the declassification process. Um, so everything was not only looked at initially when the records were approved, uh, whatever it is, an order or 
um, any type of record. Everything was a record. Um, briefings. Um, but it was then, again, looked at when we had a FOIA request come in for it um, in order to declassify, go through the de declassification process for some of the records or um, to redact what was needed. So that there's just an additional step. And the military, in addition, is a very complex beast. So she said the first five days are looking at the record. Our first 10 days, we're just getting it to the right organization. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Um, just real quick, does everybody know what the Five Eyes is? I'm cognizant that that's a pretty wonky term. No, the Five Eyes is basically the, the intelligence partnership in the world um, between the US, Canada, the UK, Australia, and New Zealand, um, which are very close intelligence partners, um, which is what he was referencing. Awesome. So. <laughs> so I, I, I've got my FOIA request ready to go. I want to walk you through what I did, and I want folks to tell me if there's something I could do better or something that's not going to work, what the problems are with it. I'll probably just Would that get a be FOIA legal right advice? now. What's that? Would that be legal advice? No, no, I just want <laughs> No, you're not. I'm right, just no. teasing. Go All right. So what I've done is here, it, it comes with, you know, when you use a site like Muckrock or the other ones, they will give you suggested language to begin with. And so this one just says, this is a request under FOIA. I want these records. And so I've asked, started off with, with a broad thing. I say, I want records related to the CBS TV show Hunted. I give them a link to it so they can go and know exactly what I'm talking about. And I say, included but not limited to, because I'm going to give them records I'm specifically looking for, but I don't want to um, uh, give them an out because I didn't name the exact form number of, of something so that they can't just be like, well, you didn't ask for form 65324, which has happened to me before that they claim that I need to name the exact record like, you know, form that needs to be filed. And so I've, 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 I've kept it a little broad. And so the first thing is pretty general. I want communications between the Department of Homeland Security and CBS regarding the show. I went and I went over to Wikipedia and IMDB and identified that CBS doesn't exactly produce the show. A company called Lock and Key Productions produces the show. So I added that in. I also went and, you know, having watched the show, noticed that there is a uh, an actual DHS employee on the show named Jermaine Finks. So I've asked about communications related to Jermaine Finks. And then I have, I wonder, I wonder, is this actually a propaganda show? Is this show funded by DHS? Is that, is that what's going on? Because this is a show that, um, if you're not familiar with it, um, I probably should have explained this before, but it's a reality show where teams of two go on the run and there's a team of like intelligence officers who have to track them down. And if you survive 28 days without getting caught, you get $250,000. But the, uh, the, the folks have all sorts of technology out there and access to databases. We're going to find out later how real or not real this is. Uh, 7 o'clock panel, if anyone wants to come in, in this room. Um, so I, I wanted to know whether they've actually provided any funding to this show. And then I wanted to know whether they actually gave them access to any databases or technology. And then maybe there was no involvement whatsoever between DHS and this show. But I have a feeling that somebody at DHS watched the show, maybe wrote a summary of it, said, hey, here's you know, the issues that are out there that are being discussed. I think people should be aware of them. And so I'm asking for any kind of reviews, summaries, or analysis uh, of the show Hunted. So that's where I am on this right now. Um, There's their stock language also that comes in as saying that these are not uh, these are available to the general public. They're not being made for commercial purposes. I ask for the uh, I I, uh, I tell them that I want to know what the fees are for copying before they they charge them to me or they bill me. I say that I want them electronically as an email attachment. If they can't do an email attachment because they're still in 1995, then I'll take a CD-ROM, and then I say thank you because. It's nice to be nice to FOIA officers, right? Being informed <laughs> nice to FOIA officers. It will get you farther. Yeah. And, uh, and then I remind them gently that they have a deadline to get back to me. Sincerely, me. All right. Thoughts on my request? You can start with it. Okay. So the first thought on this request is how many seasons has this show been on the air? One. It started okay. in 2017. So you maybe, I would say, want to limit your date range. Okay. You want to talk about what it took to implement the show and maybe into three or four shows in because that can speed up the time that it might take for them to respond to you. Okay. Um, that's, that's my first suggestion. Let me think about this for a okay. moment or two longer. Amy, you got any thoughts? So I think you want, sorry, I f think you might want to think about further narrowing it. Um, 
which is weird from a FOIA requester, but you do want a response as quickly as possible. I just um, want to. I just want to buy this panel next year, so I got a year. So, but you say records relating to the show. So I'm thinking, what records could DHS possibly have related to the show, which could include like security that they wanted to put in place for where the show was filming. Um, like more procedural records, which don't seem to be what you're looking for. Um, so you could actually put up top records related to DHS's involvement with the show, as opposed to any procedural things that they're doing to prepare for the show's filming, um, which still gets you the very broad categories and makes the, the form that you might be looking for that you don't know to name show up but does kind of take off the, that other category of records that they could possibly have that you might not be interested in. Okay, so I've made, I've made those, uh, those things. I'm going for a two-year, I'm going from 2015 because I don't know how early they started the show, but I know it's not before 2015, I'm, I'm guessing, and then I'm going till today because you can't ask them for, like, rolling records. I can't ask them for records that, if I send this today, I cannot ask them for records that came out tomorrow unless I file a new request. Pam, any thoughts? Um, I think those are all good. I was thinking of maybe a list of DHS employees involved with this so that later you can more narrow it because you know specifically. So then when you come back, you can ask for maybe their specific emails, correspondence with specific people. Great. You might also want some briefing materials between DHS employees on why they're getting involved with this show. So you mentioned funding, correct? Yes. Uh, so are you talking about did DHS have any involvement in the initial startup funding or ongoing? Either one, I think. Uh, I, since I don't know what they have, I'm just going to be broad about funding. I imagine there's someone at DHS who controls the purse strings who can maybe look it up. Maybe I'm wrong. I mean, what's the worst that can happen is that they say you, there's no responsive records, right? Like there's no major loss for me here, right? Yeah, maybe add um, any written agreements between DHS and either of the production company or Hunted because you might find it'll be easy for them to pull any written agreements and you can find more documents that way. All right. Um, okay. Anything else? Nope. You're just like, oh, you've got to narrow this down. Just pick one thing, uh, one thing. I'm going to tell you that they're going to come back and go, ah, that's too much. <laughs> but, I mean, it's easier for them to take one request than for me to file, what, seven different requests, right? Or no? It is easier for them to say you need to be more specific and give you some areas where you could narrow that down. Um, if you are going to get a, a FOIA person who's going to lend you that type of assistance, it's not a requirement uh, on behalf of the FOIA. We just tell you it's overly broad and you need to narrow this down, so get creative and think out of the box. All right, we'll see. So I want you all to come back to this panel at DragonCon 2020 <laughs> and we'll check back in to see how this is going. I was going to say maybe a quicker way would be to do a, a California request. Well, so I, so here's here's one of the things that I wanted to bring up. So Virgi Georgia and Virginia have a citizens only uh, FOIA law, so you cannot file a request, or they won't. They, it's up to them if they're going to honor it or not. If you do not live in the state, so um, I would be filing one because the show is uh, is involved with the the Georgia Economic Development That's Agency, right. and. Uh, it also has relationships with Florida and I think South Carolina and um, uh, I think that might be it. But I would be filing a Georgia one today, but I live in San Francisco. So in past years at this panel, I have tried to file Georgia requests and I've gotten rejected as not being a Georgia resident. So I, I, I would need somebody else here to bust out their laptop and file it instead. <laughs> we, can, we can meet up. I got a booth. We can sit down. We can, we can jam, generate artist. some of these. So the state state level stuff. You're fighting over hunted or just over? <laughs> to the city of Atlanta. And they are very tricky and sneaky and difficult to pin down. I've never dealt with the state, but I understand the state is reducing 
constantly reducing its um, their their um, the citizen access to records. They're closing things up. Um, so I wouldn't mind doing this as an experiment just to see how it works in the state and maybe learn something. So I don't have anything else to do. Awesome. So I'll meet with you. Okay. Wow. But I did want to say, as long as I have the uh, mic, um, so this is what the city of Atlanta does. They, they throw up roadblocks. And we had a recent I issue, and uh, I'm a private citizen. I'm just a neighborhood activist. Um, who's trying to stop some environmental destruction in my area that it would be like a mini Houston if they keep paving over the floodplain and poisoning the, anyway, that's, that's my stuff. But um, we're having, a, we have a corruption investigation going on involving the mayor of Atlanta, Kasim Reed, and an, a, a department head. And the, he would, they kept saying, well, this is, um, it's personnel information we can't give out that. And then they said it's, it's under litigation. We're not allowed to give out information when it's under litigation. So the newspapers, they filed a, a suit. And so here's what he did. He comes, there's a room like this, and there are bankers boxes lining the whole back of the room up all the way to the ceiling, unlabeled, and pages and pages, three million pages, photocopy, copied pages or printed pages, and, and it was totally useless. So I'm wondering, um, you know, how, what, you know, and, and in my case, I can't afford a lawyer, and the people in my neighborhood, we're, we're not going to hire somebody, but this is the newspaper, this is the public journalism, and they are being foiled about a very serious corruption investigation that's been ongoing for a long time. So I wondered what any of you might have any thoughts about that. And you said this was litigation? This, this was is after a, a suit. criminal investigation of an employee. Uh, it's a, I believe it's bribery mm -hmm. or possible other but forms But where of you corruption. got the documents? Was it just a request or did you actually file Well, I had nothing to do with it. The newspapers, all the news media went in and they were denied over and over again from the city attorney saying with, with what I assume were spurious reasons why uh, these papers couldn't be released. And one of the things, one of the exceptions to FOIA, I think, is personnel information. So although the FBI and everybody was involved in this, it, it had gone past being personnel. Um, so he, finally, he did agree to release it, but he did it in such a form that it was useless. And that's, that was my point, that when I've gotten information, um, it's, they charge me 10 cents a page plus $15 an hour for the employee who has to gather it, and then I have to come down here at my own expense and my time and go through it all. So this is how the city of Atlanta is spoiling um, citizens knowing what's going on or finding out or, or being able to, to um, you know, especially if you, you know, this is not, I can't get a lawyer to do this. I would have to get them for free and if there's anyone here who would like to work for free. Um, so in my case, it is about a local, it is a very, it's a hyper, it's a very local issue. Um, so, but the city does not want the public in its business. You know, they want to do things without being bothered. So that's, I just would like to hear more about that. Okay, so when it comes down to uh, a denial for personnel information, you could ask a very, open-ended question saying like I'd like a list of all of the salaries in this department of not names but of whatever the positions were if you say if the media or someone was looking for that type of information when you are looking for person specific information uh, and getting into their employment records and things along those lines that's when that exemption kicks in so that's how that personnel exemption would kick in. And my understanding is, and um, please correct me if I am wrong, but if something is under current litigation, uh, it can't be released because all of those documents are tied up in that litigation. Go ahead. I've only seen when it's involved in an active criminal investigation. And so, yeah, I mean, I've had the same problem in Colorado. If there's an active criminal investigation getting the police reports or their correspondence to the evidence that the police have. Um, how I've gotten around that is kind of taking it agency by agency specific. 
um, contacting, getting that relationship with um, the person who's doing it, um, usually explaining that this is a limited purpose I'm using it for. I'm not going to be disclosing it. Sometimes I sign a confidentiality, but that's because I'm, I'm trying to advise the victim if they should bring a civil case and they have the statute of limitations and it's being tied up in a criminal case. And so um, I've just taken, that's the only tactic I've been able to do is just approaching the specific agency separately and kind of explaining what I need it for. But it's still an uphill battle for me. So I know we have a comment up front, um, but just three things that I want to extrapolate because I think they're good lessons for people actually from your case. The first is exemptions have to be applied narrowly. So they can't exempt an entire document because there's a person's name in it. They have to redact the name and they have to be very specific with how they apply those exemptions. Um, so you don't necessarily want an email address, but you can still get the email. They can't use the ex they should not be able to use the exemption for the entire document legally. The second thing to extrapolate is fees. Fees are a really big deal for a lot of people. Um, and fees under the federal level, there are a lot of ways to get fees um, waived, both the processing fees and the duplication fees, which are separate. State level, you all should be aware if you're filing state requests, sometimes those don't exist. I know in New York, um, th they don't exist. Yeah, Colorado, we have exemptions if you're not using it for profit, and, and if it's for the public interest, you don't have to pay them. So they can be very, they can, in certain states, they can get very high very fast, and you should, if you're filing state requests, you should be aware of that, um, because they do try to stop things that way. Um, the third thing to take out is the bene one of the benefits to litigation, and if you can find a pro bono attorney, a lot of times they will do FOIA litigation. And it'll, because it's written, like I said, the litigation is on the records, a lot of people will go at it without a lawyer. I don't necessarily recommend that, but you can find pro bono. Um, the benefit of litigation is you get what's called a Vaughn Index. And Vaughn Indexes are freaking amazing. What they are is it's a list of every single document that is produced in that FOIA request, along with all of the exemptions from within that document. They have to catalog it. Um, it's a requirement of litigation. Um, so it's an extra benefit. They don't have to do anything to um, make the request easier. And I've received ridiculous requests, not to the extent that you're describing with like boxes of things, um, but I've received responses that are very hard to go through. Once you litigate, you get that Vaughn Index and it makes going through the documents a million times more easy, easier, sorry. Uh, the only thing I would add is that I think that for community activists, uh, sunshine laws are incredibly powerful. I have seen cases in the past where uh, a you know activist may be upset about a um, way they're going to be redoing a park and they don't think that the contractor process they went through is very transparent and they'll start filing requests and that will result in the agency taking another look at it or even stopping the contract and rethinking the whole thing because somebody's finally looking. Uh, um, so, so what I want to do real quick is I just want to hit the submit button and I want to get a round of applause for Sunshine. I filed the request. Uh, we can take more questions. Um, well, or if you have experiences or you want to ask anything to the panelists, just go for it. Hi, David. Uh, first, I saw you yesterday and your face did not look like that. I hope they caught whoever did that to you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think it was like in the sh TV show Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency. I think it might be a cat that did it. Uh, I have to go back and watch it. But uh, yeah, uh, I'm okay. There's nothing under here. All right. I have a different kind of request uh, that I'm looking for. I hope the room doesn't find it frivolous. There's at least three people in the world that are interested. That would be me, myself, and I. I'm a local history writer from Knoxville, Tennessee. I have a colleague uh, who's an archivist who, while doing her master's degree probably 20 years ago, did an FBI FOIA request uh, regarding a very charismatic bank robber who decided to hide and open in Knoxville in the 1920s and 30s. Um, <clears throat> they did a lot of delaying. They gave her a big, huge list of stuff, uh, charged her enormous fees. Um, she eventually had to abandon her master's uh, or change her master's because of it. But she has a remarkable memory, and she says, hey, Dean, your guy used to hang out with this bank robber, and they have transcripts, how they got transcripts um, of surveillance of the two of them hanging out talking. I want those. So how would I go about requesting uh, with the FBI? 
I, I got the two names. I might be able to get the dates narrowed down, but they're specifically from Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, are they are they dead? Oh, long dead. Okay, if you can, it, it helps if you can get some sort of documentary evidence that the person died, whether that be a news article. I mean, you can always get Not a death a certificate. Then that 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 makes things significantly easier for getting uh, records on de someone. Death certificates are a lot harder to get these days. Yeah. Well, you know, so we, we have a, a friend uh, named Parker Higgins who runs a site called FOIA the Dead, and he has automated it that when he sees, so it looks for <laughs> obituaries of prominent people and then files FOIAs for them, and then it come back in and he uploads it. Um, and, and so, he, yeah, it's a pretty it's a pretty interesting way of going about it. Uh, Amy, maybe you know more about this or... Um, no, but I know that he probably would be interested in this. Yeah. He should reach, he's on Twitter, he's yeah. on email, you can contact him, and he might be willing to do this. Yeah, yeah, he, he, yeah, he probably would, yeah. Um, the bank robber is semi-famous, my guy isn't. Uh -huh. um, but uh, that, that's the angle I'm looking at. So. And you have a pretty narrow request there. You have dates, even well, broad dates, Well, I don't, dates, I don't have, have states, I have the location that the surveillance yeah. was at. I can narrow it, it's a two-decade window. Um, the specific years I might have a hard time with. He was a bank robber in hiding, mm -hmm. but very charismatic, um, liked the ladies, the ladies liked him, uh, got around town, so. I yeah. would file a request on the, F it's really easy to file a request with the FBI. They have a portal, like what Dave just used. You put the names down, put whatever dates you have, put the location, say you're looking for transcripts, and I would see what they get back to yeah. you. Um, FBI is also file. fairly quick. Yeah. Um, well, the, the whole file apparently is quite extensive because he was embarrassing the hell out of the FBI. Okay. Um, <laughs> and he broke out of jail several times, uh, robbed banks in the South. Um, they, um, no. You, you haven't heard of him yet. Um, I call him Basil the bank robber. I'm not going to use his real name because there are people working on this to make money off of his story. Um, so uh, I'm going to hope to make money off of the other guy's family. <laughs> but one of the things she said, um, heavily redacted documents, which we found odd, uh, given the, the time period and, and what it was about. Any notion of what they would redact from? and. We have no idea how they actually have transcripts, given that there would not have been electronic surveillance. It's like, are they sitting in the bar with them? Uh, um, the, the ways of government redaction are often a mystery. Um, Do you want to go back to the re exemption page real quick? There's an FBI informant ratting on other people. Nope. Nope. Um, both, both of them were dirty. Yeah. So, so we got about, uh, I think, uh, uh, seven minutes left, so let's uh, try to knock out some more questions for people who are asking. Um, with we yeah. So so with 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 FOIA documents, it's um, so there's this reporter named Jason Leopold who files thousands of these things, and his general rule is always appeal. Even if you get records, always appeal because chances are they miss something. If you get it's redacted, like appeal and just start there. That's the first thing I would do. After that, just go through the same process you would for anything. Go to OGIS um, and then go to litigation. Or go right to litigation if you've got a lawyer who wants to do it. The, the exemptions are fairly straightforward. Dave lists them. Ch say they don't fall within the exemption. Um, there's a lot of really good information online. It's fairly succinct. Um, my one caution is they can classify things at any point in time. So even if you request a document that's not classified, they can go back and classify it. Um, I've had that battle with people before. Um, but the, the exemptions are fairly straightforward. They're in the law. They're numbered. They're easy to fight, and you can fight them. The same process. Same process as requesting. Hi. Uh, uh, the other half of the FOIA equation is making sure there's something that exists to be FOIA in the first place. Uh, what effect do you think the past spate of really high-level FOIA uh, discoveries have had on the government agencies willingness to honor the Federal Records uh, Act in the first place <clears throat> I found they've just gotten better with FOIA in the federal government to be honest they're cataloging records better because they want to respond they they don't want these records requests sitting in FOIA offices for a zillion years um, they're trying across the board I think is my like my general interpretation but it's hard Uh, 
Um, I think that there's a lot of agencies that have started being proactive with making things available because they know that people are going to be requesting these documents and if they actually just put them all online and come up with a system that just automatically does it, they can save a lot of uh, staffed power and a lot of energy just by, by default. And I would love to see, I love seeing when agencies start doing that and creating open data hubs. Um, and that's a sort of uh, an improvement that I've seen is agencies starting to realize that these documents that people want aren't necessarily PDFs, aren't necessarily paper, but are Excel sheets. There are you know CSV files. There are you know data. They're big data, and they a lot of them started to realize that these aren't just you know uh, gadflies who are trying to harass the government. They're people who actually want often want to make government better. They want to help the you know help make you know the you know community better and so by making some of this data available actually helps improve government i think in san diego for example they have released all sorts of data and had app competitions to see what uh, local developers and, and students can do with the, the data to make it easier to report potholes to look at uh, property records more easily that kind of thing I also know that um, there's a lot of new software development that's come out. There's, it's in particular, not to promote them because I'm not affiliated with them, but there's something called GovQA, which has an open and backward-facing <laughs> portal such that once a FOIA request has been made, the city can just put that up there, and if you have a question, perhaps that question's already been asked, and you don't have to go down that route again. At the federal level, 18F, which is a fairly new federal agency, is trying to do something similar for the federal agencies. Um, it's a big project. Uh, I, was, I was aware of one instance in which a Virginia FOIA act, uh, request was filed. Uh, the agency printed out, you know, did a computer query, printed out the computer query, then sent it to a clerk to uh, copy it on the copier, and, uh, building up the copying cost and the time of the clerk to do it, to you know just hit at the person filing, you know run up the cost. That was 20 years ago or more. Um, I was drinking with the uh, secretary that did it, and said, you know, her boss said, do this. Well. I, that's an unfortunate perception that uh, everybody thinks that you're trying to run up the cost. You need to think of the scope of what you're asking again. If you're asking for uh, emails and documents from high level uh, people within the department under FOIA, say you're looking for the city manager's uh, emails. Under FOIA, the city manager then has to assign that role to someone who has access to his email. So the lowest paid employee with access to that information is actually extrapolating that information and making it available. It is not like you're going to be paying that city manager's hourly wage to dig out those documents for you. Uh, unfortunately, when those FOIA requests are super large and there are many people involved, and you, you, know, you do have to look at the burden that you're putting on the agencies involved because it's time and money out of their pocket to provide you the information that you're looking at. So, okay, well, sorry, so I think, I think Marcel had an idea for an answer to that as well. I'm not not saying. However, <laughs> 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 and I think that um, they're busy. A lot of times it's just an additional duty. That wasn't my primary duty. I might add the printout was destroyed no, right. afterwards. I mean, I'm not saying that it's not a malicious thing, but 99% yeah. of the time, it's, sure. this is an additional duty, and like, you know, the person actually like giving the record, they have a real job to do. They have a real job to do. The people that are making the records, those records are their job. It's not necessarily to produce the records. So don't assume that it's because they don't want you to get the record. They're probably just busy a lot of the time. And, and it just makes them sloppy sometimes or whatever. Can we, can we take that one last quick question? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, this one wouldn't be requesting any kind of federal uh, Laws or any, like information. This is more. I live in Florida, so Florida has great open records laws. Great. Yeah, yeah. So, long story short, I have a total d-bag neighbor, right? <laughs> or I did. 
So uh, this guy like lived in a house across the street from us, and he used to do things like, for example, like the little part of the street in front of his house. He was telling everyone in the neighborhood, "Well, all like that area is for me and my guests," and we're like. No, it's a public street. We all pay taxes on that. Ain't happening. <laughs> so you know, he, and he tried to say that to me. It's like, no, 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 no. You don't mess with me, man. So I started to park my car right in front of his house, <laughs> all the time. And then I would make sure my girlfriend, if she was coming home, I'm like, wait, 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 wait. I'd move my car up a little bit, so her car was there. Way to de-escalate that. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> and then if I saw another neighbor coming, it's like, hey, we'll move our cars forward because no one liked us, dude. So now there would be three cars all across his thing. And then when he's going to mow his grass for some messed up garden he had, I'd be like, hey, how you doing? So, all right, you know, fast forward a bit, right? He always liked to like wedge his car in as close as he could. This is like, you know, parallel parking to make it really hard for people to get out. I had a Mazda Miata, so I just laughed at the dude as I uh, pulled out. But then one day he Park, it was trying to park really close to my girlfriend's car and dented it. So it's like, all right, well, we called the police, but basically because my girlfriend had gone, did some shopping, came back, the cops like, I can't do anything. Uh, then, yeah, like the next day, he called some, not the police, but some kind of like community officer. It was like, yeah, he called about, you had like noise complaints. Actually, no, they couldn't say who it was, but I'm like, was it house one, two, three, four? Like, I, I can't say. I'm like, all right. So, you know, I was able to go to the clerk of courts website and uh, they had some good stuff, you know, like all his uh, records, you know, arrests and all that, like driving the wrong way while, while drunk. Good job, dude. And I went to the uh, tax assessor thing to, 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 uh, to get info about that. And the reason I wanted to get information about that was he got smart. I don't know what disability he claimed, but then he made the space right in front of his house. He managed to put two uh, of those handicap signs. And I was like, well, how do I compete with that? I'm not handicapped. <laughs> so uh, now I, I wanna know things like, because the clerk of courts, uh, information was there, but it wasn't very detailed. So I would like to get information like, okay, did he really send that officer over to my house? Uh, any kind of like, how was he able to do that with the, with the parking space? You know, how do you get to put those signs there? Because I couldn't find anything like that. So uh, any other kind of things like, can I get that stuff? All right, so, so quick answer because we got to get out of here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, you could definitely put in for records related to complaints. They may redact the name of who sent it, but you may be able to get text of it or whatever notes were taken by the officer. Uh, you can go to the, the city department that handles street signs and just ask for information, give them the address of where those things are, and say, hey, I want all information regarding where this was. Chances are, if they put that up, it went through some committee, um, some city committee that had to approve the expenditure of like 500 bucks or whatever to put it up. And they'll have you know off an audio tape of that discussion and what happened um, and there will have been something that was generated by the officer uh, the official who had to suggest that thing that explaining what the needs were um, and and what the rationale was for doing it so those were that's what I would go with if, if anybody else has anything else but otherwise we, we kind of have to wrap this panel up so thanks everybody um, Amy and I have a table over on 2F by the escalators if you want to come talk more and you can send a message to your member of Congress we promise if you make a phone call you don't have to talk to a person yeah about net neutrality <laughs>